Hello everyone, welcome to our first Hashtag Our Future Israel event. What's at stake, annexation, and an uncertain future. My name is Adina Wollner. Um, I live in San Francisco, though I am presently in San Diego, and I'm the chairwoman for IPFT, the San Francisco chapter. I want to first recognize the moment that we find ourselves in. Today, raising our collective voice for what is right and what is responsible is more important than ever, as we stand in solidarity with all those in the fight against racial injustice and inequality. We recognize that we have important work to do at home and abroad. As our organizational friend and former diplomat, Tamara Coffin Wittes wrote last week in Brookings, last week for Brookings, let's continue reaching our hands across borders in solidarity and get to work. Today we face a July 1st deadline where the new Knesset government intends to begin the process of annexing large portions of the West Bank. Why is this something that I and so many of us personally care so deeply about? Why are we compelled to educate ourselves and peers about this issue? After high school, I chose to make Aliyah and join the Israel Defense Forces as a lone soldier. I served in combat support as a radio communications technician responsible for the encryption machinery for the Nahal Infantry Brigade. Though I grew up in the United States and my parents and grandparents are not Israeli, I felt strongly that it was my responsibility to protect Israel as a secure, democratic, and Jewish state. While I may not have been able to articulate that at the time, my rationale for making the choice to, to serve has touched each of those values. I see my choices to engage in education and elevating the discourse around Israel here in the United States as a leader in IPF Atid, as a continuation of my service. I'd like to not only welcome you to all to this call, whether you're dialing in from North America or other time zones more, more globally, but also to point out that the attendees today and IPF Atid's community uh, more generally reflect a breadth of opinions and perspectives. We welcome you all to this discourse, including those who align closely with us and those who may disagree with some of our assumptions. It's our hope that we continue to grapple with these issues in a forthright and inclusive manner. With the end goal of advancing stronger and more responsible leadership in Washington and in our community. Since our founding less than three years ago, IPF Atid now has six volunteer-led chapters nationwide in Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, DC, and San Francisco. Today's call fits with our existing Israel Policy Forum's educational initiative known as Hashtag and Station Watch as well as introducing our brand new Our Future Israel mobilization campaign. Today's call will focus on the policy and intellectual foundations for these campaigns, and we'll share more info on how to become involved in raising our voice with our hashtag Our Future Israel. I'm so sorry. I thought that outside would, would work. And save the date, June 11th, at 11, 1130, will be our official campaign kickoff featuring my, my new IPFT leaders, MK Stuff to Fear. Our conversation today will be led by IPF Atid's own national dire uh, director, Adam Bastiano, who has taken many of our pre-submitted questions to help guide our conversation today. We're also very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Shira Efron in Tel Aviv, who serves as a policy advisor in Israel Policy Forum, is a visiting fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies, and is a special advisor on Israel and the Rand Corporation. A very busy national security analyst, as you can tell, Hold on two seconds. Uh, Shira is, leading, is a leading voice in all things Israel, Israeli politics, security, and foreign affairs, including her recent work co-offering IPF support in search of a viable option, evaluating outcomes of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and with leading research on Israel-China relations. Aaron David Miller in Washington, D.C., a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for the International Peace, um, and someone you have heard, likely heard discussing foreign affairs on CNN, BBC, and NPR. Erin spent decades in government as an analyst, and negotiator, and advisor to Republican and Democratic Secretaries of State, helping formulate U.S. policy in the Middle East. Thank you all very much, and Adam, the floor is now yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adina, and thank you all for joining us on today's call. Um, thank you also for submitting some topics and questions that are at the top of your minds that uh, certainly helped us frame some of our uh, entry points to this discussion. Aaron and Shira, I really only have a couple questions for each of you before we can um, see where the conversation takes us and take some additional questions from uh, the many young professionals and other friends on the call. 
Um, I do want to start before asking my, my first question. Uh, I pulled a quote from the Israeli press earlier this morning that I think helps frame a little bit of uh, our analysis uh, today and looking into the future, where Ben Yamini writes, on the topic of annexation, no one has seen the annexation map. The ministers don't know what it looks like. The IDF commanders are clueless. It's doubtful whether the prime minister is familiar with such a map. He goes on, um, but uh, the crux of that certainly opens up some interesting uh, doors for conversation. So my first question, Aaron, uh, amidst this, there have certainly not been a shortage of op-eds of programs like this focusing on annexation. What's been missing from this conversation on annexation in DC where you sit and perhaps across uh, the United States? It looks like we'll look to unmute you, Aaron. Great. How are we doing? Is that, is that okay? Perfect. Okay. Um, I was saying it's an honor to be here with Sharon and Dina and with you, Adam, and obviously you've spent an enormous amount of time organizing um, a TEED for IPF. And I, I, I can only say IPF is an extraordinary, remarkable organization. And I think it's tethered, frankly, to trying to find a way to chart a course between the world the way it is on one hand and the world the way we want it to be on the other. And therein, I would argue, lies most likely um, the sort of balance that is affected for um, policies that actually can work. I mean, I would just also want to add uh, that uh, I've worked for Republicans and Democrats and voted for Republicans and Democrats. And to me, the dividing line, and I speak to you as an American, which is my first priority, safeguarding American national interests, um, out of it, out of government, um, that the dividing line for an effective U.S. foreign policy is not between left and right, liberal or conservative, or Democrat and Republican. It's between dumb on one hand and smart on the other. And the only thing Americans have to decide is which side of the line do they want to be on, the smart side or the dumb side. Um, both R's and D's have at alternative times been on both sides. Um, this administration, preternaturally, by and large, has occupied the dumb side. And um, I think, frankly, that's made this particular issue even more difficult. If you ask me what was missing, I would, I would say, uh, in, in a way that reflects my annoyingly negative views on these matters, that annexation actually masks and reflects the much more serious problem that Israelis and Palestinians and anyone who wants to see a conflict and an agreement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict face. And that is a fundamental crisis in between Israelis and Palestinians on the issue of whether or not there is common ground to deal with the five or six core issues that drive their conflict. And um, I only say that because even if Mr. Netanyahu decides, and I think a compelling argument can be made precisely for the reason that you, you began, Adam, that July 1st may come and go without a formal annexation, even if that transpires, um, it still reflects and will leave us all with an extraordinarily difficult environment. And I, I just don't want to be lulled, lulled to complacency by winning the battle over annexation, but in essence, losing the war. Awesome. Thank you. That's I think great. Great way to jump into this, and Shira, I'm going to toss this question your way from the Israeli angle where you sit. Uh, what's been missing public from the public sphere, security sphere, political discussions? Is anything being misunderstood or neglected as it relates to this topic of annexation? 
Um, sure, I'll, I'll get to it in a moment. Just want to say thank you uh, for having me on this call. Thank you, Adina from the beautiful California. I miss it very much, although maybe not today. Um, and thank you all for being with us. Uh, there are clearly other issues on the agenda in the US and I appreciate you taking the time to think about something so far away. Um, you know, it's hard to to speak after Aaron Miller, who was, you know, my hero and sort of coming to coming to age, I wanted to be earlier when I grow up and uh, be involved in peace negotiations. And there are no peace negotiations today that I'm all grown up to be involved in. When you talk about what's missing in the conversation, it's pretty much everything of substance. Um, and I can just give you an example. The other day, I was in a discussion group of national security experts. Many of them uh, have started in the idea of nothing related to the West Bank or the Palestinians, but you know, in very prestigious IDF units. And when we said something about the annexation, they said, oh, no, 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 we should not take a stand on this. This is purely a political issue. And I said, wait, this is a national security group. And we are inter interested in national security issues and economic issues and diplomatic issues. There were lawyers in the group. This is a legal issue. But it's all reduced in the Israeli mindset to a political issue. So even the fact that you say, wait, we have to discuss this. This is a game changer, a strategic game changer. It has not been done in 53 years for a good reason why it's not been done. Um, you immediately flag as someone who is taking a political stand against it and not from the right, from the left. Um, you spoke about not seeing a map. I think, and I, you know, I don't know what goes on in uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's head, I dare to say that I'm not sure he made up his yet, even though we are very close to the deadline. Um, I think that he still is not sure if he's going for the full, you know, the full Monty, 30% annexation, um, uh, using the euphemism of extending sovereignty, applying the law, whatever you want to call it, it's, it is annexation. Um, something much more limited. Um, you know, sort of like the settlement blocks and we can go into what these specific uh, things mean or postponing the whole thing altogether. And you start seeing some hints that he's saying, oh, the US administration, it's not where it was before. And you have the settlers that are pushing against it, some groups in the settlement community. And of course the left the, that you can always blame. So to be honest, I, I'm not sure. Um, we know that it, this is going to happen. And, and this is probably the reason why there is no map that uh, he sh the, the government has shared with anyone. However, um, the mapping committee apparently has drawn a few optional maps. Um, they have someone named Dani Tirza, who was a, a retired colonel from the IDF, and he actually is a mapping expert. He helped, uh, uh, I think he was responsible for the root of the separation barrier between Israel and the, Pal and the Palestinian territories in the West Bank. And um, he, uh, as far as I can understand, there are three options that he's showing. Again, full thing, not full thing, just the settlements, the Trump plan, whatever it is, uh, and some other options, all of a very, very, very problematic. Uh, but the fact is that those maps have not been shown to anyone, including to the IDF that's been marginalized. That tells you about how much is, uh, is uh, missing from the discussion. Israel is now, the new government is cutting the budgets from the Ministry of Welfare. You have 2 million people, I mean, uh, no, I think it's two million. No, maybe a million people. Anyway, it's the highest unemployment rate that Israel's experienced. I'm just wondering. And as in many parts of the world, right? Um, annexation, only the threat of annexation is going to cost million, billions of dollars uh, because of you have to recruit uh, uh, reservists. And this is how it works in Israel. Just, just on this, no one is talking about these issues. The, 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 the conversation is, is this an opportunity because uh, Trump is in office, um, and should we do it before November or not? Opp opportunity to do what? To uh, <laughs> take over land in an official way that Israel controls de facto anyway? Um, this is very unclear, and I think it's very much missing. And you know, you talk about how many webinars there, year, there are about this topic, but I don't think that there are as many in Hebrew as you think. Uh, there are more in English, probably. Mm -hmm. It's an important point, and I'll just add that later this evening, we will be having a Hebrew speaking uh, private salon webinar uh, for some Hebrew speakers. So if anyone on the call would like to join, reach out to, reach out to us because we agree with you, widening the discourse on such an important matter 
uh, is, is the task at hand. So we've identified a theme around smart policy um, and a little bit of contextualizing where we are. There was at least a Channel 12 poll touching on what you just mentioned, Shira, in terms of what uh, are the key issues that Israelis and the Israeli public um, believe the new Israeli national unity government should focus on. And I don't think people will be surprised to hear that um, the top two, 69% said the economic crisis in Israel and 15% um, uh, signaled the coronavirus with the last two uh, at 4% respectively being annexation and the threat from Iran. Um, so I don't think much surprise there in terms of what is the news of the day which I, I think does a little bit help us introduce a second theme, which is an important one, and Aaron, you touched on it, and that's the topic of time and the short versus long run. Um, so I'm curious, uh, maybe we'll start with, with you, Shira, this time. Um, on this short versus long-term perspective, um, are we focusing too much on one or the other? Um, is, it, is it a balancing act? And, and how does that relate to this July 1st deadline that's been thrown around um, in the Knesset um, kind of documents going into this new government? Well, this, this whole deadline, the July one date is uh, something that I think many of us, and I don't know if Aaron had the same feeling, but many of us heard Netanyahu say in his own words and explaining why annexation doesn't make any sense, had thought that he would push for further, that uh, is not as in, his, is in his, his interest. I'm not sure I'm buying the whole ideological thing coming from him. From him. Um, I, Personal, I, you know, I thought it, it would be something that will be some sort of like, we'll let it go, we will see it being pushed and, and postponed, and, and, and it might be, but it was all around a political discussion. These all annexation talks started before uh, the first uh, round of elections, I think. You know, there have been three in the last year and a half. Um, but, but I think what's more important is that, yes, we are in discussion talking at least in, in, in these, on the Israeli side of things, uh, people talk about the short term and not so much on the long term. There's like a game of assessing where, whether the threats are credible. Um, is Jordan serious? What will they do? Are the Palestinians serious? What will they do? Will the Europeans sanction us? Will they? Uh, will the Egyptians really do something? Will the Emiratis really not buy technology from us? Will Biden, if he becomes president, really reverse uh, recognition? This is everyone's talking about. What's missing from the discussion are the long-term issues, which are uh, obviously, uh, let's take the European example for, for just something I think people are not talking about. All the discussion about the Europeans, like, oh, the Europeans are so weak, they're always threatening things, they will not dare to sanction Israel, and if they do, who cares? It's not about European sanctions at the moment. Europeans at the moment, it's true, they have a strong commitment to the only Jewish state there is, especially Germany, if you think about it. But, you know, annexation goes against uh, EU values, and they would have to respond. It might be small response to Israel. But once the United States withdrew funding to the Palestinians, you know who's bankrolling the PA, the Palestinian Authority? It's the Europeans. Already we're seeing, and the World Bank report said that this year is going to be, are going to be the lowest uh, levels of uh, donations to the Palestinians from the international community. And what we hear already, uh, in, you know, in behind closed doors among European uh, saying, you know what, yeah, we can't really respond to Israel, but what we can do is stop giving the Palestinian aid. If Israel wants the land so much, it should pay for it. Do you really think Israelis even um, think, conceive that they are going to be responsible for the social security, for the education, for the health care of 2.7 million Palestinians from the West Bank? No one is talking about these issues. Uh, of course, the security stuff. Um, Jordan, uh, Israel is trying to normalize its ties with the, uh, 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 you know, it has all these back channel ties that Israel likes to flounder uh, with the Saudis and the Emiratis and other countries. 
nothing is going to get improved uh, if Israel annexes territory. And, you know, they talk about Jordan and say, oh, Jordan is so dependent on the Americans. They're so dependent on us. They will never dare um, canceling the peace agreement. Well, guess what? I don't think it's such a, and it, this depends on to what, um, how um, deep the annexation is, right? That not all annexations are, are equal. Uh, but once you start, we don't know where it ends. Uh, but you, I speak to um, IDF and intelligence ex uh, experts, and they say that this is not an unplausible scenario uh, that Jordan would really, really, really undermine ties. And this hurts Israel's security uh, in the long run. Um, unfortunately, I think that um, we're not seeing enough of these discussions uh, in Israeli um, maybe in, in behind closed doors, but no one dares to speak about them public, um, except for a few analysts. They're definitely not in the press. And if you look at the Israeli public, and I'll end this, when you look at the Israeli public, it's just a poll that came yesterday uh, asking the public um, to what extent the Israeli-Palestinian conflict concerns you is one of the topics that you think about most. It's not even the top, top five for sure, but I think not even the top eight. The annexation is not on anyone's mind, and, I'm, and I don't blame the public. They're, you know, they're Israel sort of recovering, hopefully not getting into a second wave of COVID-19. People are worried about other things, but those long-term risks uh, versus benefits that I fail to see um, are not being uh, communicated uh, fairly, I think, to the public. Thank you. I think you managed to answer five or six of our submitted questions all in one. And before we turn to you, Aaron, I'll, I'll guide people if you are looking for additional research and data in terms of these short and long term ramifications of annexation through Israel Par Policy Forum's partners, the Commanders for Israel Security, and through the aforementioned Annexation Watch project. You can find a lot of the, the data and statistics um, that are guiding a lot of uh, these discussions at Annexation Watch. Uh, that you can you can find on our website. Uh, so, Aaron, let's 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 jump to you and perhaps uh, sticking with this theme uh, of looking looking to the future. We can also ask you a little bit to also look to the past, as we got a question come in from Alex. Um, I believe Alex is is actually joining us in from from Europe. He asked uh, broadly, how do you look at the current situation in the context of the history of ups and downs? Israeli-Palestinian negotiations history. So perhaps yeah. you can in your answer, looking to the future, you can also tie in some, some of your experiences from the past. Yeah, I, I'd only make a couple points. Number one, long the difference between short and long term in the minds of Israeli prime ministers, at least this one, is much different than in the minds of political analysts uh, and even strategic planners who may work for the Israeli prime minister. And I think this particular prime minister, it's it's actually stunning. There is a, a broad strategy that uh, Mr. Netanyahu, uh, with respect to foreign policy, uh, which essentially involves two objectives. Number one is freeing Israel from what he, he believes is the shadow of an Iranian nuclear weapon. And second, it's not becoming the midwife or the father, the progenitor of a Palestinian state um, which is, which would come into being on terms that were in any way, shape, or form remotely acceptable, uh, even to a dysfunctional, corrupt, and divided Palestinian national movement. Um, I think Mr. Netanyahu and Shira make some very compelling points. I would ask in terms of short and long term, when I do, when I do anything these days that involves any measure of risk, including you know, at 71, deciding to go to the local Safeway, I ask myself, what's the point? And from Mr. Netanyahu's perspective, it's, I'd be really hard pressed to identify an incentive with any form of annexation, whether it's light annexation, soft annexation, or as Shira describes, the full Monty, not outweighed by the negatives and the disincentives. Um, it really doesn't help his politics. He's already demonstrated an uncanny ability to create a, a government which both helps him fight his trial and positions him well, even 18 months from now when the supposed rotation takes place with a majority in the Knesset 
it gives him the ability to still remain the most politi influential political figure in the, in, in the country. So I'm not sure his long term extends much beyond an 18 month or two month or two year time frame. And it's driven largely by his determination to beat his conviction and, avo and avoid uh, a prison. And it, it's worth remembering that Ehud Olmert, who was not indicted while he was a sitting Israeli prime minister, the indictment, I believe, occurred in February of 2009. The conviction was not upheld until 2016, seven years later. This is not going to be a short, a short trial. And only make one other point, which I think is a baseline for the Trump administration. They may well believe, and if you look at the um, decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel, and in May of 2019 to actually open a US embassy there, the reaction was deafening silence. Had the Americans done that 10 years ago, there would have been a, in my judgment, a major, a major eruption. They may well believe that some form of annexation, uh, that they can get away with some form of annexation without paying a huge price. I don't know if that's the case, because I, I agree with Shira. I think Mr. Netanyahu is really caught here. He's the he's the Hamlet of Israeli politics: to annex or not to annex. And I don't think he's he has made a decision, even though we're only three weeks out. Quickly on, on one last point, does the corruption trial impact in your mind, and Shira, feel free to weigh in here, the perceived legitimacy of these actions? This is a question we got from Eric in Chicago. Is there a legitimacy question here? You mean legitimacy of, of the Netanyahu's legitimacy or the legitimacy of the government? Of the, this drive towards annexation amidst these uh, political... I mean, yeah. you know, you, you have the hope of the center left in Israel, Benny Gantz, perhaps for the most noble of reasons, making a judgment that he needed to be a part of this Israeli government. You have labor representatives in this Israeli government. You've got an Israeli public, and I think Shira said it well, that is either going to support or acquiesce in this move. This is not a question of two Israels, the bad Israel on one hand and the good Israel on the other. There's really only one Israel, and it's being led by an incredibly willful and skillful Israeli prime minister. The real question is whether or not he's prepared to do something that is not in his resume, which is to be really risk ready, rather than his traditional risk aversion in matters relating to peace and war. Here, I'll give you the, the floor to pick up on, any, on anything or I can ask another question. What do you think? So, you know, I, I don't know, like Aaron says, that, you know, the legitimacy question, everything is tied to the political situation. It's not unlike the situation in the United States. Right? It's really hard to uh, differentiate what has changed in Netanyahu's assessment, except for having the president in the White House, which would not oppose uh, such a step. Um, there are, I don't know, they're, 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 they're on both sides, you feel that some people say that actually it's Netanyahu is, uh, uh, he's trying to portray himself as the leader of the right, as sort of like it's identity politics, it's us and against them. And if I'm uh, bringing this achievement to the Israeli right, and he's portraying himself more to the right than he's ever done, uh, then the court, then the court case that the trial is, um, it's not a legitimate case. It's uh, one camp in Israel trying to persecute him, but it's not him, it's against the whole camp. So this is one 
one assessment. I'm not sure it's true. Um, another assessment said that Netanyahu will try to convince people that only he can annex and there, therefore it's in his incentive to sort of like stretch it and not do it uh, so that they keep him in office. So I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm really not sure on this legitimacy question, but you know, Aaron said it well. I mean, you're, there was supposed to be an alternative. Um, Benny Gantz, with all his flaws, uh, had a remarkable achievement where not just the, 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 the mandates that he received and uh, his party received in, uh, in the election, but also the fact that in polling, he was ranked as fitting to be a prime minister, uh, which, you know, there was an alternative for Netanyahu, which the Israeli public has not seen for uh, a over a decade. Um, but uh, the opposition is now ruined. Netanyahu very skillfully um, really, I, 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 it killed it from, from, from within. Um, and, uh, and they're quite on the annexation issue and they're quite on other issues that presumably that's why they went into the government to defend the democracy and rule of law and not the annexation issue. Um, so, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure there is a connection, but we are not. It's hard to assess it. I want to introduce one other uh, topic that we've only touched on briefly, and that's the the question of the U.S.-Israel relationship and the the bipartisan uh, relationship. So, uh, perhaps starting, Aaron, I'll, I'll throw it to you. When we look at the relationship uh, historically, but also where it is now and going into the future. Um, Piecing that together, whether we're looking at shared values or shared interests, how does this conversation relate to, to this topic of U.S.-Israel relations? I mean, I think that's an incredibly important question, and I think it's a question that uh, your organization, Adam, um, needs to focus on, because I think there's a generational aspect to this. I'll simply lay out the two schools of thought before um, telling you which school I ascribe to. The first school is what I call the Cosmic Oive School. The Cosmic Oive School argues that the U.S.-Israeli relationship is headed for a huge crater, that a combination of factors has created a situation where the coincidence of values and interests between the United, values and interests between the United States and Israel are as divergent now as perhaps they have ever been. Now, I would only ask to risk this by saying that Israel remains the only nation in this broken, angry, dysfunctional region where there is any coincidence of interest and values. But remember, there's a big difference between saying the U.S. Israeli relationship is special and saying that there is some coincidence of interest between the U.S. and Israel, both on values and interests. So, this school argues that it's going to crater, that you have the Palestinian issue and the changing nature of Israel in the mind of America is headed south. A younger generation of Americans is either uninterested, actively disinterested, or increasingly critical of two things, Israel's treatment of Palestinians and the nature of Israeli democracy, and second, what should U.S. policy be uh, toward an ally in which on certain issues there appears to be no coincidence of interest. Um, and that's reflected in the changing nature of what Democratic candidates, stunning to me, what Democratic candidates during the last six months before the plague set in have said about Israel. That you could use the word racist in the same sentence as the Prime Minister of Israel is just a, a new reality looking back over, you know, my participation both as an analyst and as a and, and as a a senior State Department official working this issue for almost 25 years, it's extraordinary and it's symptomatic that the space for criticizing Israel, fairly or unfairly, has essentially expanded. And you see it. So that's the, the Cosmic Oive school. The other school 
argues that, uh, to use a Yom Kippur sort of metaphor, there is a way to avert the decree. That if you had a change in leadership in Washington, a president who wasn't willfully trying to politicize the relationship, and a change in um, leadership in Israel, that much of the problems could be ameliorated, not resolved, but ameliorated. Adding to that the fact that however bad Israeli behavior may be, it pales before the behavior of Israel's neighbors. And I think this is a, this is a point that, you know, to me is inescapable. The U.S. is trapped in a broken, angry, dysfunctional Middle East, which is not going to get any better anytime soon. And as I mentioned before, there's only one country in which there's any coincidence of values and interests. Only one. Saudi Arabia is not an ally of the United States. Under no circumstances. Its interests episodically coincide with ours, and there is no value coincidence. Israel still, on paper, in theory, and to some degree in reality, still maintains that sort of, of coincidence. Therefore, this school argues that the cratering is not inevitable. It's subject to change. Um, and um, the process by which this cratering is going to occur, if it occurs, is going to take a lot more time. One last point. My acid test for determining when the U.S.-Israeli relationship changes is when I see large numbers of Republicans and Democrats, large numbers in the House and Senate, debating two questions openly and honestly. How is Israel treating the Palestinians and why? And what should U.S. policy be? Because there's no debate on these issues. And there hasn't been any debate, serious debate on these issues in the House or Senate for, well, ever. Thank you. Very interesting. I think you, you laid out some polls in, in the conversation on both ends. Like most things, when it comes to complex and international affairs, it's, it's often somewhere in the middle. Uh, but politics are a big part of it. And as a, a nonpartisan organization, and uh, specifically with our IPF Atid group, with um, my partners, Adina, and, and many other IPF Atid volunteers across the country, the generational aspect is certainly an animating discussion, if not um, one that really guides some of our thinking going into the future as it relates to uh, the long term and overcoming some of these partisan issues and, and short term obstacles, if we can focus on the long term. Uh, and some of the values behind where we want to guide uh, these conversations into the future, which Adina mentioned the, and this hashtag behind me on this nifty backdrop, hashtag our future Israel, which will be guiding some of our IPF Atid work uh, for the second half of June. Uh, I'll encourage people to continue posting questions in our chat and Q and A. Uh, it's really helpful so we can kind of integrate them in with this, this fun discussion. Shira, uh, you spent many years living uh, in Adina's backyard in the West Coast, and now you're in Israel. You want to comment on the U.S.-Israel relationship side of this with your unique background? Um, Feel free to disagree, you know, with Aaron, if you. No, don't. no, I, I very much agree with with Aaron Miller, and um, I think we need to, you know, remember this and put things in perspective when we talk about. Israel and the shared values and the shared interests. Um, going to the future, and because we're talking about young, you know, young people, just by sheer demographics, uh, there's a question of whether Israel is going to remain a priority country, a priority ally. I'm putting this aside for a second. Uh, you know, the United States is changing. The Trump uh, administration, the coalition that we're seeing now is not going to stay there for a long time if you look at just demographic trends. And this is something we need to remember. On the shared interests, um, and I'm quoting here um, 
Ambassador Dan Shapiro, who was US Ambassador to Israel, and he wrote a very, I think, very interesting uh, forward to the study that um, I uh, co-authored with Evan Gottesman uh, uh, for IPF on the looking at sort of like, if not a two-state solution, then what? Looking at the other options that people are suggesting out there. So Dan's point says, you know, the whole point about US-Israel relations, this is, and you know, Aaron worked on these issues for so many years, so he knows them uh, intimately. It's not just charity. It's not just like we love Israel. Uh, it's not just values. They're real interests. I think it was uh, Vice President Biden who said if, if Israel didn't exist, the United States would have to create Israel. Uh, because Israel does a lot of things in the Middle East that, you know, it, it helps the U.S. not do. Um, so there are real, real, real interests. The, the point that Dan Shapiro makes is that if for some reason, and this reason could be a deep annexation, and maybe not the, the minimal annexation that is just symbolic for Netanyahu to do something that doesn't really close the two-state solution. But if, if, if Israel controls the lives of Palestinians without giving them equal rights, and this is not an interim situation on the pathway to two-state solution, which is the situation now, but everyone understand this is just a temporary situation. Uh, if Israel does that in the long run, um, it can raise questions as to what extent is Israel really uh, a democracy, a democracy like the United States and like the European allies and like uh, the United States other strong allies, New Zealand and uh, Australia, the Five Eyes. And um, the point is that the United States still works with countries that are not democracies, right? Uh, you mentioned Saudi Arabia. This is a clear example. There's the United Arab Emirates. There's Egypt. There are uh, some interests, but the partnerships is, are very, very different. The level of engagement is very, very different. And I don't want to make this comparison. I think it's very provocative, but people say, oh, it will never happen with Israel. Well, look at Turkey. There's some processes in Turkey that if you think of Turkey, a NATO ally where there's strategic nuclear weapons, United States safeguards, and look at Turkey today because of an erratic leader that uh, enacts steps that, you know, Turkey does not, uh, it, it does not look like a democracy anymore. And uh, it really changes strategically how the United States and other European countries think about it. I don't know if Israel is going to go down that path. I certainly hope not. I hope that if Israel annexes the territory, it will be as minimal as possible. It will not close the door on a two-state solution. But when one of the options is this 30% West Bank um, and uh, a potential cascade, cascade that could lead to the dismantling of the Palestinian Authority, not because they want to dismantle the, the, the Palestinian Authority threatens, but, but the fact that there's a combination of factors and uh, there's a real threat to its stability and Israel ends up controlling the lives of Palestinians and not giving them rights because it wants to preserve its Jewish character, uh, that would raise uh, questions about Israel's nature and its democracy, and I think this is uh, this in the long run could be a, a bad thing. And and it, it's not I'm not part of the Oive camp, but I could see why we can get to the Oive scenario if 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 we're going in that um, in that direction. Um, mm. I don't I don't know if you do, you agree, Aaron. I don't. Maybe maybe it's uh, it's it's too far fetched uh, chain of events that I'm describing. No, no, I don't think so. Um, sure. I, I mean, I think um, part of the problem is that I don't believe that the U.S.-Israeli relationship such as it is and as it's developed, let's say, since the early 70s, um, can survive in its current form as a special relation, truly special relationship, and, and, the, U, and the word ally be used in a serious way unless the value component is interjected. Israel does not want to become Panama. It doesn't want to become South Korea, even though South Korea is a democracy. It doesn't want to become the Philippines. And it certainly doesn't want to become Turkey. And I don't know, this is going to be a question that uh, IPF Atid is going to have to grapple with in the, de in the decades to come. In my, in my view, I've always argued, that when the vision of Israel changes in the mind of America, when in fact the support of, of Israel in the broadest conception of what constitutes American national interests, that we have a stake, 
in promoting relations with nations, however different, that share our values, when that changes, I think the nature of the special relationship fundamentally has changed and it will not be redeemed or rescued by millions of evangelical Christians who for reasons of eschatology and even their own sense of values, common values uh, with, with, with Israel as a defender of American interests in the region, they will not be able to save the relationship. Nor, frankly, will the five and a half million American Jews. This relationship, it's a paradox. This relationship has remained as resilient, as special, and in my judgment, there are times, now is clearly one of them, where the special relationship has become exclusive. That undermines our credibility. As an American, I, I'm deeply offended by that. But I think that it's, it, re, it really is a question of whether or not the values and interests can still be made to, um, to align. And I think that's gonna be a function largely. This is why the Palestinian issue is so pernicious um, and creates so many undesirable ripples. Um, but I don't have an answer. I mean, I would like to ascribe to the, what I call the realist school, not the cosmic oive school. People I respect and have worked with and for adopt the other view. And they urge me to open my eyes and understand what's happening out in the streets in particular. I mean, my own kids, you know, they're in their late thirties. And they both have had special sort of uh, relationships with Israel. Um, but they are not, uh, you know, un, un, they, they're not unadulterated believers. My daughter, I think, still, still wrote the best book, um, Inheriting the Holy Land, uh, An American Search for Peace in the Middle East, that I still think is the best book for young people on this subject. And we've had screaming matches with one another, whether Israel is a democracy or a preferential democracy. So I, uh, and my son's as critical as my daughter on this subject. So I need to admit, I think to myself, that and I see it out in the streets for the last week in a positive way. It, things are changing, and I need to take all that into account. We'll be happy to be a, a thought partner with you on that, Aaron. And in a second, I'll invite another one of our IPF Atid leaders to, to wrap us up and, and share more about what we're planning with this new campaign. Um, but we do have a handful of, of minutes left to maybe go through a speed round on some topics that have been submitted um, and maybe I'll just quickly run through them. And Shira, you can take a stab at which ones you want to jump into, and then Aaron as well. Um, but let's see, we have a question uh, about the Trump plan in general and how that relates to uh, this conversation. There is a, con a question that was submitted from one of our young professionals in LA asking, is there a pro-peace rationale for annexation? Uh, we, we might not have too much time to dive into that, but feel free to answer that. Um, we also have some questions about uh, the Arab-Sunni relationships with Israel and how annexation factors into this, uh, into those um, shifting relationships in any way. Um, and let's see, we also have a handful of questions about the Palestinians themselves uh, and their, their room for, for maneuvering in any way. Um, some may recall my colleague Michael Kapla wrote a column about uh, a week and a half ago titled, There's No Better Time Than Now for a Palestinian Peace Plan. Um, so we have had some questions about uh, their role in all of this, uh, specifically why or why not is President Abbas's threat to cut security cooperation with Israel different this time, or perhaps not. Um, so we have a handful of, of uh, routes to go in 
whether it's on the Palestinians, on the Trump plan, on the region as a whole. Shira, why don't we give you a handful of minutes and then we'll, we'll circle back with Aaron. Let's have, uh, let's unmute you. Sorry. Great. So I think the Trump plan, I mean, we can go in, uh, long into it uh, now. Um, it basically green lights annexation. There's always been the idea of that in part, in all the negotiations, you know, and there are negotiators here in the room that conducted, but we, there was always a clear a concept that Israel would annex territory but in, ex in an agreement and in exchange would swap territory that is equal in size and quality. What we're talking about now is very different. It's an exchange without giving anything in return. The Trump plan um, has this concept, but uh, very different uh, ratios of what Israel actually swaps uh, in terms of both quality and, um, uh, and area size to the Palestinians. I think one of the issues that is actually making this harder on the anti-annexation, you know, the, the, the analysts that are saying, wait, annexation is, um, is irresponsible. When, when you talk to some Israeli leaders and you say, well, what about if it's a small annexation like Gush Etzion and Maale Adumim, and I don't know how some people on the line have been to these places, but they're very much within Israeli consensus terms of the largest, you know, settlement blocks, what they call, and they will be uh, as part of it, there will be part of Israel um, anyway under any peace agreement. They're in the Geneva Initiative, uh, uh, the only sort of blueprint that Israel and the Palestinians have agreed to. Uh, so they're saying, so what is the problem? They're in this agreement anyway. They're, for, for, they're forever going to be part of Israel. Um, why is that a problem? But they were not to be part of Israel without uh, the other side of the coin, which is Israel giving something in return. So I think, of course, there's, there's a component of annexation in a peace agreement, but not when it's done this way. Um, inside. I think on the threat of the Palestinian authorities uh, uh, to cancel um, the security coordination with Israel, we know it is serious because it's already happening. Um, we are seeing that uh, at the top level, um, you know, and it's, this is what I know on, at least as for a few days ago, that was the situation at the high level. Uh, there are no more discussions. Uh, there's still intelligence sharing. Some may be red line meetings, but we're already seeing the decline in cooperation. Already. So this is much more of a credible threat than if we've ever seen, um, which is very, very, very dangerous. It's not just the terror attacks that we think would be geared toward Israel. What happens is in practice, if there's no coordination, the Palestinians themselves, security forces who are now uh, responsible for you know handling crime arresting people uh they are losing access to many parts of the west bank to the palestinians themselves which means that if and this happens there's domestic violence case in, in at home idf soldiers will have to go deal with it this is not something that the, uh, the israeli defense forces want to do but that's what happens uh we're, we're going to look at the um, increased crime crime rates um also increased um hostility toward the pa itself and one of the fears is also that with the threat of annexation the palestinian um security forces not coordinating with Israeli, uh, with their Israeli counterparts and uh, not getting their salaries because the, uh, we haven't spoken about it, but the, the, P, the PA is facing its uh, worst fiscal crisis ever. Uh, it's not that they would no, not show up to work with their guns. That's not the, the, the worst fear. The, the worst fear is they will show up to work elsewhere with their guns. Uh, and they would be aimed both toward the Palestinian Authority and of course to Israel in the end. I'll take, uh, I'll let Aaron pick up on the other questions. Um, I only make one comment on the on the Trump peace plan. I, I had some meetings with Mr. Kushner um, in 2017 and 2018. And when I met him for the first time, I said to him, I wish my father-in-law had as much confidence in me as your father-in-law appears to have in you, because he's given you Mission Impossible. And uh, I think that if in fact, and I only pose this as a question, we don't have time to, to answer it. If in fact getting to a negotiation was not the main objective of the Trump peace plan, and I can't believe given the way it was laid out, it had anything to do with negotiations, then you'd have to ask yourself the fundamental question, what was the purpose of the plan? Um, one additional 
a comment on the and the Arabs, strictly the Saudis and the Emiratis. I had a piece in Politico not too long ago. I got a lot of bad Twitter Twitter comments because I suggested that in in one of the most extraordinary ironies, at a time when Israel has be has been led for the last decade by an Israeli prime minister who, to be fair to him, never supported a two-state solution, doesn't support it now, and is determined to do everything he possibly can within certain boundaries to make sure one does not occur. Um, and yet, Israel's reach and range in the world has expanded to a degree that I never believed possible. I mean, never believed possible. I mean, you've got more countries with some form of diplomatic representation in Africa, Latin America, Europe, Asia. You've got things happening in the, in the Arab world that I never believed could happen above the waterline. And then you have the more clandestine Israeli Saudi relationship below the waterline. So the, the left's view that Israel would become a pariah if they didn't settle up with the Palestinians, at least until now, has simply not been borne out. And I, the reason for that, Iran, Arab state exhaustion, frustration and anger toward the Palestinians, following their own interests, so whether it'll last, I'm not, I, I think it'll last to the degree that the Emiratis and Saudis and the Israelis don't expect too much of this relationship and, and essentially want to protect it. But it's a remarkable, it's just a remarkable reality. And I'm not sure I can explain it entirely. Thank you. Well, we certainly can, can go on for, for hours and hours as we identify all the different tangents and ways that this specific conversation on annexation intersects with others uh, in, in Middle East policy. One theme that I would like to circle back into uh, before giving the floor to my, my friend Zach in DC is this question of amidst all these complexities and unknowns, um, I believe we at Israel Policy Forum and our extended community across the United States um, are really pointing to responsibility, uh, responsible leadership, responsible statements uh, and responsible, hopefully policies um, when it comes to these unknowns, uh, because there are uh, serious implications as we've, uh, you know, explored from multiple angles, but certainly on the, the human individu individual level, responsible leadership uh, impacts the lives of millions, certainly as we're seeing uh, in, in most countries around the world, uh, including our own. So Zach, I'll turn it over to you so you can connect some dots between this conversation and the campaign that we've been referencing. Um, and thank you all for joining, Zach. Thanks, Adam. As Adam said, I'm the chair of IPF Atid's network here in Washington, D.C. I'm also a student at George Washington University's National Security Program and a former Jewish community professional. I wanna thank both of our speakers, Aaron and Shira, as well as Adina for your insightful comments on the dangers and uncertainties that Israel must contend with while considering annexation. I want you all, I want to invite all of you to our upcoming program this Thursday, June 11th at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time as IPF officially launches the Our Future Israel campaign. This will be a time for young professionals and other leaders to connect and discuss these issues and raise our voice against annexation. In the spirit of raising our voice against unjust policies to create the world as we want it to be, I ask that you all help us champion what you want from Our Future Israel. I encourage you to visit the Our Future Israel website and also to use our hashtag. We look forward to seeing you soon. Stay safe and stay healthy. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Aaron, Shira. We'll, we'll hopefully continue this conversation uh, once we know more. And I wish you all a nice week. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Shira. And thank IPF. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Terrific. It's our pleasure. Thanks. Stay guys. healthy and safe. You too.